thank you very much. Um, how can a man talk about women in finance? Who else is going to talk about it? Um, let, let me just, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk this evening, talk to you. Um, when I was approached by Jeanette and the AU to, um, to participate in this event, I first of all start off thinking, well, you know, I could easily bring out the standard private equity module and just chat to you about what we do and how we do it and that sort of stuff. And then as he talked further and I found out the talk was about 10 minutes, all I thought you could, I could do in that time was to give you an insight. And the question is an insight into what? And um, as we were talking, Jeanette actually interrupted me in the middle of a very, very deep, deep um, uh, process, which is for us fundraising, where I'm basically asking people for money. And she came into my office at a point where we just had lots of pensions funds and insurance companies from around the world doing, doing uh, due diligence on us and finding out about us. And one of the things that they said, particularly Americans, was sort of, why do you have so many women? And that is the genesis of this conversation. And that's the genesis of this talk. Because in answering them as to why uh, we had so many women, I thought I'd give an insight into why Livingbridge uh, is a leader in this respect. Um, this is a topic which I, felt very, I feel very strongly about. I feel very strongly about it because I just don't think we ask ourselves enough questions about it. Now, actually, there's a better question which I think someone asked me. They said, well, why are you as an ethnic minority talking about diversity and focusing on women? That's a, that's a better question, uh, a better issue. Anyway, um, my response is this. I'm talking about diversity, OK? I'm not just talking about women. I'm talking about race, gender, age, sexuality. It's diversity, in particular with reference to leadership in finance. OK, you just have to look at what's happened to finance over the last decade and a half to say the kind of model we've been approaching hasn't really worked that well, has it? Now, I've only got 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to focus on what I know. And what I know about, a little bit, is women in leadership roles in private equity. To kick off, let's, let's just go, let's go wide for a minute and set the scene. So according to the World Bank, something like, uh, well, half the world are women. And yet, less than 10% of women are in leadership positions. OK, that's too broad, right? It makes no, no, no sense. Let's go to the UK. Again, roughly half the workforce is women and just 28% of that, those women are in senior positions. Let's focus on the financial sector. In terms of the UK financial sector, 34% of women are in management positions, so they're on a ladder, they're getting there. How many are actually CEOs or in senior positions? Less than 28%. So I ask a question, why in 2016, you know, 100 years or so since uh, women got the vote, are we still talking in the way we're talking about gender diversity, if you are talking about it at all. Living Bridge. Um, a small aside, uh, usually what people say when they introduce me is uh, Living Bridge, which used to be called ISIS Equity Partners. Um, so thank you for not doing that, but I've just done it myself before someone else gets in there. Um, Living Bridge, we've been around for some 20 years, and I've worked in the business since inception. Um, I've been managing partner for, since 2000, so for 15 years. And um, some of you may, may, may know me, I certainly I think some of the BBC colleagues remember, I had a sort of my two minutes of fame back in 2007 when the private equity industry was in, in the news, let's say that, let's put it that way, and where the Treasury Select Committee took a real interest in what we were doing and invited me and a few of my colleagues to come and talk to them. Um, and, and the BBC, etc., filmed it and it all got very, very fraught. Um, but for those of you who don't know much about private equity, what we simply do is we invest in unquoted companies, and in backing those companies, we're all about creating value through growing them. Uh, and if we grow them and do a great job of that, backing entrepreneurs and, and really good management teams, then these businesses can become household names. It's a fascinating industry, diverse, and involves us interfacing with the great British entrepreneur community, which is diverse and different. It is not homogenous. Um, Back in 98, when I was given the opportunity to start to lead the business, to re-establish the business by a company called Friends Provident, which was our parent company at the time, um, we had two really distinct disadvantages at Livingbridge. The first was the person they picked to lead this initiative was 30 years old and had a track record of about four or five years. That was me. I didn't really know what I was doing. 
I still don't understand why they gave me the keys to the car. Um, and actually, because of that, I had a very limited track record. And we were employing some five people and had something like 50 million pounds of funds under management. Now, I knew I had an ambition to grow and develop the business. I knew I needed people to grow and develop the business. And I decided that rather than follow the slavish approach of doing what everyone else is doing, we would establish a very different business. I haven't got time to go into why we're different, but if you ask people, if you come across people in private equity about living bridge, they'll go, oh yeah, those guys, they're a bit different. Um, and, and the big difference was I set out to say I wanted a modern private equity business. And it was really clear to me that I didn't set out to say I wanted women. What I said I wanted was the very best people, full stop. Didn't care where they came from, didn't what color they were, what gender they were, what, what, uh, what um, sexuality they were. I wanted the very best people to join. Now, because we had disadvantages around, number one, a guy who was 30 leading a private equity business, when most of my peer group who were running private equity businesses were in their mid to late 40s, if not older, and had been in the industry a long time, it meant the usual suspects who had track records and things you can bring to bear just wouldn't join. They kind of looked at it as a bit of a joke. But what I did was I said, look, I've got this vision, some ideas about how we can change the way that private equity works, and I started selling that idea to people. And I had two areas where I had great success. One was very young people who didn't know any better, and the other was with women. And, um, you know, to, to give you a sense of where we are today, we now manage over two billion pounds, and we employ some 85 people. Uh, our partner group of 13 comprises four women who started from entry level and went right way through to, part, to become partners. And in fact, our CIO, my number two, is a woman who started when she was 26. Um, furthermore, our chairman, our chairman is a lady called Dame Alison Carnworth, who some of you may know is a very well-known uh, city figure. Uh, Alison joined us as chairman when she, we, we were starting back in 2000. Um, as a business, it wasn't about going and doing business as usual. It was about embracing the talent that you have available to try and create something extraordinary and different. Now, back to the Americans. The Americans who said, well, well, we go and do due diligence, as they call it, on lots of funds who we want to give money to. Why is it that your fund has more women than any other place we can see? And by the way, that's by a country mile, certainly at this very senior level. And, and I say, look, I, I didn't set out to do this. I took what I had, and I made the very best of it. And the very best of it was about addressing some of the issues that people find difficult. So if you have a mindset that says people might want to go have a family, and that's a bad thing, believe me, you're going to not make it work. If instead you go, I have a talent pool, I want a broad and deep talent pool of experienced people at the very end, as in when I'm trying to pick leaders for my business, I want to choose from not just the people who didn't have families because they're not biologically suited to do that, but just the whole population, then what you do is you work around the problem. And working around the problem is quite straightforward. You embrace it and make it a very positive thing. So I know people come in and they say with trepidation, I'm going to have a baby. And rather than the you know, response they get in some places, which is essentially their career is over, we embrace that as being a very positive thing and go, how can we help to make this for you a straightforward thing in terms of how you're going to do it and, 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 and leave the business for a bit, and more importantly, how you come back. And we have an open conversation about it. Now, we muddled our way through that and made it work for one person. And you think, well, actually, what's one person? Maybe we can do it for two, three, four, to a point where it's just not even an issue. We don't think about it like other people as being a particular problem. Um, the second thing is the environment. We have a very strong culture. Uh, the typical way private equity works is you have usually an alpha male um, who goes out there, finds these deals and backs these companies and through his own extraordinary skill and, and amazing uh, ability makes a, a great business. That's not reality. Okay? The reality of how you make decisions in an investment is you share, discuss uh, and embrace other people's ideas. The culture we have encourages that. In private equity, that's not quite the way it works. And actually, in that sort of environment where you don't have to sort of charge around um, being the alpha male, it, it just speaks to a more diverse place where people can share their ideas 
and whether they're male or female, you invite them to talk and, 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 and discuss. And the environment is less aggressive, uh, quite frankly, uh, and it doesn't need to be um, in order to get success. Uh, so that's what we found. Um, it, it's actually one of the simplest investment decisions I can think of, which is to think about investing in people and the topic of this conversation, this thing we had to talk about, is investing in your business. Well, a simple investment in your business is investing in your people. Investing in your people means investing in all your people, as far as I'm concerned. So making this a positive thing, getting a mindset where you don't think about it as a, as a difficult thing, is one of the keys to getting, getting it sorted out. I think by industry, unfortunately, from what I can see, we've still got a way to go. Currently, there are, um, if you look at private equity globally, something like 12% of senior employees are women. Uh, in Europe, that drops to about 10%. And the gap at the, uh, the larger end, the high profile end, the people whose names you know, uh, I probably should, should mention, given it's being filmed, um, but the larger end people you know, um, the variability is, is, is extraordinary. It ranges from at the very bottom end, 2%, to some what, one or two exemplars at sort of 15%. Now, that's just ridiculous. Um, clearly something needs to change. And, you know, we need to encourage uh, women to see private equity as a long-term potential career, one that's not going to be disrupted by the fact that they may want to have a family. Um, in our industry at the moment, we have a recently established not-for-profit group called Level 20, which is making a good start in this because it's founded by 12 uh, very senior women in private equity who have set a goal and that is to have 20% of, of, of women in senior leadership positions in private equity by 2020. And we, Livingbridge, are a founding member of that organization, and I have no doubt that they'll make a real difference, particularly as they're working hand in hand with other groups like the 30% Club, like Women Banking and Finance, City Women's Net Networks. It's all about working together to change the mindset and to ensure that we don't cut ourselves off from a very talented generation coming through. Um, if I, if I just pause now and, and, and think about the future, um, could 2016 be a turning point? Particularly when it comes to women leadership and, and particularly when it comes to thinking about role models. Because for me, that's usually the key to getting change, is you have a role model who people can look to and emulate. Well, if uh, Hillary Clinton wins the American election in uh, November, then there will be five women in charge of the world's leading economies and also organizations. The US, the UK, Germany, the IMF, and the US Federal Reserve. So just think about that for a minute. Three of the world's largest economies and two of the world's most important financial institutions we run by women. Now with international politics in some sort of turmoil and a growing sense of unease with all the um, geopolitical instability we have, um, is it a surprise that you have a situation where you could end up with five women leading these august institutions on countries? Actually, if you look back at some research which has been done in the US, what you'll see is that successful, we have a successful business that actually hits what they call a glass cliff. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. What, what, what the evidence will show is that these businesses which have ended up being successful, when they hit a problem, what they do is they think outside the box and usually have hired a woman to run the business. Now that, that, that I'm, I'm looking and going, well, maybe that's kind of where we are in 2016, given how unstable the world is. Um, and I want to just say that I hope this sends a strong message if we end up with a situation where it is no longer me as a man having to start, start, stand up here and talk about women, because it just should be about the best talent available from wherever you can get it. Um, to close, I thought I'd, I'd leave you with a, a little quote. And that quote is from Dee Dee Myers, the former White House press secretary in the Clinton administration. Um, she was the first woman to hold a position, and she held that position at the age of 31. She also wrote an interesting book called Why Women Should Rule the World. And what she said was, I am endlessly fascinated that playing football is considered a training ground for leadership, but raising children isn't. Thank you. <laughs>